Thanks for tuning in today. And if this is your first time, we want to give a special welcome to you and say thanks for checking us out. And we invite you to click on the link above here for the Digital Connection card and just let us know who you are and an email address and how maybe we can pray for you and if there's any questions you might have. And just want to again say thanks for tuning in. I hope this is the first time of many times. And if this is your spiritual home, we say welcome to you and, and say thank you for spending some time online with us this weekend. We want to share that we're in the middle of the God's Field is Thankful experience. Uh, tonight, they will be gathering at the Potter's House. And then on Wednesday, we're inviting the community to come and be part of our Thanksgiving Eve service as part of the God's Field experience. So I hope you can join us at 6.30 in person here in the building. And then as we lean into uh, preparing for Advent, We'd invite you to join us next Saturday for the Hanging of the Greens from 4 to 6 p.m. here at the building where we'll be putting up the Christmas decorations and we'll have a light supper afterwards. Hope you can join us. And then, yes, on Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. As we begin Advent, we'll be leaning into a series called The Call of Christmas. God had been silent for 400 years. Prophecies were hushed. Poets' pens went dry his people enslaved to the law. Until one day, when God's messengers broke the silence. Coming this Christmas, a new teaching series unlike any other. Four Holy Encounters, messages from God Himself. For such a time as this, God sent His messengers of light to call upon a faithful few, to usher in the birth of Christ. The Call of Christmas. Our Advent experience this year will walk through the lives of those who were closely part of the Christmas experience and would invite you to join us for that. And as part of our experiencing Advent, we're going to be doing a compassion tree here in the building. Uh, there's going to be an opportunity for you to take an ornament. Uh, there'll actually be a link here online to do the same thing if you'd like to participate, where we can support the good work that's being done by Compassion International around the world for those people who are underprivileged and who are in need. Yo me siento alegre por la bendición que me le han dado al niño, pues les agradezco mucho a los padrinos y a los hermanos que me han dado esta ayuda. Yo no me he Desde las tres biopsias eh, solo decían que era un, eh, un pilomatizoma, decían ellos, que se llamaba. Eh, Compasión nos ayudó con, con algunos exámenes que les mandaron a ella a hacer y, y así sucesivamente con algunos medicamentos. A God can change the life of a child, a God can change the life of the family and that makes them feel some kind of security. And so with all that, as we gather this morning on this Sunday before Thanksgiving, let's continue our time of worship with music.
I wake to a world with more questions than answers, where dissonant voices ignite division. My heart will stand firm in this decision. I choose thankful. Though I walk through a landscape that is uncharted and foreign, where the once familiar seems lost and forgotten, I will remember that nothing is unexpected to my Father in heaven, and I choose thankful. Though I live each day uncertain of tomorrow, I will accept that tomorrow was never certain and cherish every chance to witness the wonder of creation. I choose thankful. I choose faith in what is unseen, hope for a future beyond the adversity, love spoken despite animosity. I choose to believe. And though the struggles I face may be painful, though it sometimes seems impossible, though I fall a thousand times covered in the dust of failure, I am able to rise. Not because I am strong, not because life is perfect, but because in all circumstances, Jesus lives. When this world stands perplexed and demands I give a reason for the hope that I have, I can only say that in Jesus' name, I choose thankful. It's not a simple choice. It's not an easy choice, but it is the only choice that brings calm in the storm. Not by my power, but through the strength of Christ alone. I choose thankful. This weekend, we're going to lean into a conversation around the idea of being thankful. Uh, I'm calling it thank therapy. To be honest, as I've done an informal, unscientific study of good people, as I look and study these kinds of people, the ones that are attractive to me and whom I'm most likely to want to resemble, I find that they seem to share something in common. And it's really simple to spot, but it's a tough thing to put into action. These people are people that are thankful people. They all seem to have this thankful quality, if you will, in common. So consider for a moment two extremes. On one end, you have thankful and grateful people, while on the other end, we have uh, grumblers and complainers. I'm just wondering, where would you put yourself on that line? When someone asks how you're doing, what are the first words that come out of your mouth? And does your heart and mind move you more to a place of grumbling and complaining or to a place of being thankful and grateful? When the Apostle Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica, he gave them some instructions and hope about how to live in a crazy world. These words were written to a people he loved. Paul says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak, be patient with everyone, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If you would, and you've got your Bible right there, uh, underline these words, give thanks in all circumstances. And then look at the words that immediately follow, which is, for this is God's will for you. Now, to be honest, there's only a few times in Scripture where it very clearly says, this is God's will for you. Most of us, I think, want to know what God's will for our lives are. In fact, you don't have to have a relationship with God to want to know something about what your future looks like. People look at their astrological charts. They look at palm readers. They read tarot cards, things that might give them some indication of how they are supposed to live, but it's not very clear. Well, God's very clear here in his word. If you're a follower of Jesus and you've aligned yourself with who he is and his teachings, thankfulness is God's will for your life. And that's how we're supposed to live. Yet, whether you're a follower of Jesus or you're just here checking things out, let me just share with you three results of thankfulness 
for you to consider more deeply, this idea of thank therapy. First of all, thankfulness refocuses our perspective. You see, I know when my life moves to the side of grumbling and complaining, I tend to focus on what I don't have instead of what I do have. When we have times of prosperity, when things are going great, most of us tend to forget about thankfulness. And it's during times of crisis, like we've experienced over these many months, some 20 months now, it allows us to put life into perspective. And we realize what really matters are those things that can't be replaced, like relationships and time together with each other. When we have times of crisis, it helps us to sort out what's really important in our lives. If you would here in the chat, you'd be willing to be honest. I wonder how many of you are like me and you tend to grumble and complain about finances every once in a while. Whether it's the price of gas currently or what's going to be expected for the heating prices this winter or just the fact that the car maybe needs to have some work done to it. All those things are really frustrated. And then you look at your neighbor or you look at someone that you know well and you see they're just driving the newest thing and life doesn't seem to be complicated for them. But yet, I don't know about you, I, I tend to get depressed and it's just really frustrating sometimes. And I guess it's when we begin to grumble and we complain about those finances that we all need to stop and just ponder in our heart and reflect on the things we do have. I've never been accused of being a snappy dresser, but I'm actually wearing a lot of money and I bet you are too. I've got a pair of shoes that I spend about $50 on, and I've got socks on, so that's about $10. I paid 50 bucks for the pants I'm wearing. I've got this nice fashionable flannel shirt on today. That was another $35. And then when you add it all up, uh, even the idea of my wedding band or the bracelet I'm wearing, all these things can add up to a couple hundred bucks really quick. Now, you know how that puts things in perspective for me? It's when I walk in the door and I see the picture of the boy that we're sponsoring with Compassion International, and it totally wakes me up. Mawaka lives in Kenya. So that's why this Advent season we'll be doing the, the giving tree. Is just a way to pause in a moment to understand that there's, there are families around the world who make less than the amount of money that uh, my wardrobe costs for the day. And in places like Haiti and Kenya and others, it's very poor. It sobers us and it puts life into perspective. When I returned from Kenya, I had a total refocus of my life on the things that I thought were important. I saw there in Kenya people who had absolutely nothing and yet they were content. And I know and have an understanding of what it means to be hungry. I know what it feels like to go without food for a little bit. I know what it means to grumble and complain. But I don't know what it means to starve. And one other thing I do know is according to figures that you can find on the web, here's one particular one from worldometers.info, that there have been today approximately 20,000 deaths from starvation and that there were 20,000 people that died yesterday of starvation and that tomorrow there'll be another 20,000 people that will die also. Now, it's sobering, right? And I don't say all this to make us feel guilty, and that's not my intent. I say this to help us focus and to realize how incredibly grateful and thankful we need to be that we have food and we have clothing while so many in the world lack it. I may not drive a new car, but I have so many other things that I have to be thankful for. Here's one big idea for today. When I focus on what I'm thankful for, my perspective changes. I'm able to delight in God's provision for me. And when I don't have a posture of thankfulness, I tend to grumble and complain. And so a thankful heart changes our perspective and it opens our eyes to God's perspective and God's desire for our lives. And so thankfulness refocuses my perspective. And then because of that, thankfulness softens and refreshes my heart. Here the psalmist, Psalm 95. Come, let's shout praises to God. Raise the roof for the rock who saved us. Let's march into his presence, singing praises, lifting the rafters with our hymns. And why? Because our God is the best, high king over all the gods. In one hand, he holds deep caves and caverns. In the other hand, he grasps the high mountains. He made ocean. He owns it. His hands sculpted earth. Come, let us worship. Bow down before him. On your knees before God who made us. Oh, yes, he's our God. And we're the people he pastures, the flock he feeds. Drop everything and listen. Listen as he speaks. 
Don't turn a deaf ear as in the bitter uprising, as on the day of the wilderness test when your ancestors turned and put me to the test. For 40 years they watched me at work among them as over and over they tried my patience. And I was provoked, oh was I provoked. Can't they keep their minds on God for five minutes? Do they simply refuse to walk down my road? Exasperated, I exploded. They'll never get where they're headed. And they'll never be able to sit down and rest. Wow, that's the message version, and I just love the honesty of that. God was providing for the nation of Israel, and yet they hardened their heart. He was making them a nation. He was saving them from their enemies. He was dealing boldly with the people who were opposing Israel, and yet they hardened their heart, and they weren't thankful at all, and ultimately they paid a price. A thankful heart softens a hardened heart. You can't have a hardened heart when you're thankful. A thankful heart finds healing through refreshment. Last week we shared the Dare to Share experience we had for some of our students. And I have to admit to you, I was a little tired on that day. One of the things we did while we were together is we ordered pizza. Did it through the app, local pizza delivery store. Had no idea who was going to come and deliver it. Well, we decided because of just other people's generosity that we were going to bless the driver with a large tip. We were going to basically give the driver the tip of what we would have spent on the pizza because we had a gift card that gave us free pizza. So when she arrived and we began to have a conversation with her shortly, she was overwhelmed by the fact that we were being generous. And then to come to find out of all the people we could have asked, she is actually someone who has received the generosity of our pots and pans ministry. And not only that, but then because of our generosity to her, she was able to share the same kind of generosity with her own child as they began a new home. That's just incredible. And that's just where God shows up. It was the real reason why we gathered was to bless her. It's in those moments that you can have a thankful heart and you find healing and refreshment. So again, thankfulness, it refocuses our perspective. It softens and refreshes my heart. And then finally, thankfulness reminds me of God's goodness. When you're a thankful person, you're always brought back to what God has done for you and who God is. And it's simply this, he's righteous. The psalmist again says, I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing the praises of the name of the Lord Most High. He is God. God is good. And he's worth all of our praise. And here's three specific reasons in which God is good and worth all of our thanks and praise. First, God is good because he gives us free gifts. Paul says in his letter to the church at Ephesus, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. You see, grace is favor from God that we don't deserve. If you haven't grown up in the church and you're not familiar with this idea or this kind of language, it can be kind of confusing. To be honest, I would have no idea what grace was had I never come to church. You see, grace is simply this. It's unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. It's a free gift. It's one of the reasons why last week we wanted to bless the pizza delivery person was just to say to her, we value you. And yes, it was an investment on our part. It was above the normal tip that you would give someone. But we wanted her to know for no other reason than to her just working her job well that we wanted to give her a gift. Did our friend from the pizza shop deserve the money? Well, we'd already given her a tip. I know maybe some of you are thinking, well, I've done things like that and no one's shown me generosity. So don't step into grumbling or complaining. Stay focused. No, that person didn't deserve it, but it was a free gift. Do we deserve God's kindness? No. Do we deserve his mercy? No. Do we deserve his forgiveness? Nope. We don't deserve it at all. God loves us and he gives us these free gifts. That's one reason to be thankful. And here's another reason to be thankful. God is good because of his unconditional love. God's love for us, for you, is not for anything that you've done. It's simply for who you are. And that's something that's very important for you to know. God's love for you isn't based on your income. It's not based on your job. It's not based on what part of town you live in. It's not based on your looks. It's not based on the way you dress. God's love for you has no strings attached. There's nothing you can do to earn God's love. I, I heard a story recently about a girl named Susie, and Susie's dad traveled all over the world. 
Every time he came back from his travels, he brought Susie a doll. And Susie was only eight or nine at the time, and she had one of the most incredible doll collections anybody had ever seen. She had dolls from China and Africa and Mexico and Japan and France and even Egypt. One night, a business associate came over to the house and had dinner. And afterwards, the father proudly walked him upstairs with Susie to show off the doll collection. The visitor stood in awe of all the glass cases filled with hundreds and hundreds of dolls. He said, Susie, this is incredible. I've never seen anything like this. Which is your very favorite doll? Susie didn't hesitate. She went into her closet and she reached down to a bucket and pulled out a doll. The doll was messy to the point of being broken. It was missing an eye. The arm was chewed off. The hair was ratty. Some clothes were missing. It was stained. Susie said, this is my very favorite doll. The visitor was a little stunned by that and asked, why is that your favorite doll? She paused and looked intently at the doll and then back up to the visitor and said, if I didn't love this doll, no one else would. You and I and that doll are in the hands of God. We're a beat up, blemished, broken, imperfect, missing parts, inadequate kind of person. And yet, God loves us. He loves us as if we were the only one to love. And that is a reason to be thankful. Again, this is about thank therapy. Finally, one more reason to be thankful is that God is good because he gives us eternal life. Paul says here, And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. In the midst of all the craziness that's happening in this world, we can be thankful that heaven is going to be an incredibly wonderful place. There will be no more fear, no more pain, no more tears. It's going to be a perfect environment for those who have a relationship with Jesus. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk, and the bald will... Yes. So what do I know? What do I know? Well, let's move from thinking about God and his goodness to how you and I can become more thankful people. A couple ideas here. First, make thankfulness your attitude. This is thank therapy. Thankfulness is an attitude. The question is, is it your attitude? Some of us need to realize that our circumstances may never change, but our attitude can change. Some of our current pain may never go away. God doesn't expect us to be thankful for poverty, pain, the COVID virus, political upheavals. Many of us have lost family members and friends during this incredible season we've been living in. And for all of us, it's not about us being thankful for a person dying, but we can be thankful for the fact that they had a relationship with God and that they're in heaven. Thankfulness is an attitude, and it's something that begins in the morning. It starts when you wake up and you say, good morning, God. And you walk through a list of what things you're thankful for. I know there's many of us that sometimes we realize that that's not our posture and that we're not morning people. Or when you do wake up, it's like saying, good God, it's morning. The psalmist again says, it's good to say thank you to the Lord. Every morning telling him thank you for your kindness and then every evening rejoice in all his faithfulness. A thankful attitude rises above circumstances. I love the attitude of the little boy with a baseball bat who thought he was the greatest hitter in the world. He threw the ball up in the air and swung and missed it. He picked up the ball and said, I am the greatest hitter in the world. He threw it up again and strike two. He missed it again. He repeated, I'm the greatest hitter in the world. He threw it up again, strike three. He then picked up the ball and said, I'm the greatest pitcher in the world, right? We're all going to strike out in some areas of our lives. Our circumstances may never change, but our attitudes can. Second, we can make an inventory of why we're thankful. James says, and those who have reason to be thankful should continually be singing praises to the Lord. We have reasons to be thankful. Many, many reasons to be continually thankful. This is what thank therapy is all about. You make an inventory of the reasons you have to be thankful. When you do that, it changes your perspective. It moves you from grumbling and complaining to being grateful where it is God's will. Make that list and do it daily. We know that it takes three weeks to start a habit and three weeks to solidify it. If you're thankful for six weeks straight, thank therapy will become a habit. In no way am I gonna suggest that it's going to be easy, but like I shared the story of our friend from the pizza delivery company, when we lean into it, there's an attitude that we can bring that can change everyone's perspective. And what an incredible thing to be a part of. It was such an amazing thing to have her share just her general gratitude about who Linden Road is and how we met her needs in a particular way. How cool is that again? So make your list. 
and if you don't know where to start, I'll give you a hint. You're alive. Start there. Two weeks ago, there was a news report of a woman who was dead in her home for four years. No one even noticed when she died. Be thankful you're alive. Be thankful that someone would notice if you died. Make a list. Express your thankfulness. Let people know. And then make God the source of your thankfulness. Again, the writer says in Hebrews, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. People can take away your home. They can take away your job. They can take away your savings account. But they can't take away your relationship with Jesus. So here's the big idea. If you make God the source of your thankfulness, you will always be thankful because God will never leave you nor forsake you. A friend of mine shared a story with me about a friend of his who lives in the inner city of Philadelphia who runs a ministry to street kids. His name is TJ. TJ told a story that's been emblazed in my mind. When TJ was in junior high, he went to summer camp. There were seven junior high boys in his cabin. And as most of you know, at times, junior high boys can be cruel, right? Five boys, TJ and another boy named Tommy. Tommy had some very special needs, and he didn't con really connect with all the other kids in the cabin. The junior high boys made fun of him. Tommy would be walking to lunch, and they would walk behind him, making fun of the way he walked. TJ was a very empathetic person and offended Tommy and tried to get them not to make fun of Tommy. They made fun of the way he ate. The food would drool out of his mouth. All weekend, TJ was trying to befriend and defend Tommy. It was the last night of camp, and the camp director said, we want one boy from each cabin to get up and share their testimony. The five boys nominated Tommy, hoping everyone would laugh at him and make fun of him as he tried to speak. Tommy was one of the last boys to get up and share. The others had been eloquent and articulate, humorous, and they had great stories. When it was Tommy's turn to share, he simply said, I'm thankful for my friends. I love you, and God loves you. There was a pause, a long pause. He didn't know what else to say. So he said it again. I'm thankful for my friends. I love you, and God loves you. And then he repeated it a couple more times. I'm thankful for my friends. I love you, and God loves you. I'm thankful for my friends. I love you, and God loves you. And then there was silence. God's Spirit took those simple words spoken through a boy with special needs, and lives were radically changed. As I hear the story again, all I can think about are those words. I'm thankful, I love you, and God loves you. If a boy with special needs can be thankful and recognize God's goodness in his life when he's been dealt a lousy hand, then you and I can learn to be thankful too. Thankfulness will change your life, and let's start today. Let's pray. God, we're grateful as we lean into this week of Thanksgiving for all that you've given us. Help us pause even today to be reminded of all that you've done for us, the many blessings we have especially the life that comes to us through Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, we thank you for your sacrifice, for your death, for your resurrection, and the power that you give us. And Holy Spirit, we just ask now that you would help us lean into that to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. We pray it in his strong name. Amen. Let's continue our time of worship.
It's been a great year for some, and a difficult year for others. For many, it's been more of the same routine. For others, it's been nothing but change. As we've watched the news unfold, we've seen major events happen all over the world, as well as in our own backyards. It's been an interesting year, full of things we could have never predicted, even if we tried. And then Thanksgiving lands on our calendar, and we feel like we're just expected to be thankful, as if it's something we can just turn on and off. And we all know it doesn't work that way. What if this year we resolutely choose to thank God for His goodness? That might change everything. What if, in the middle of the badness, we stubbornly acknowledge that God is up to something good, even though it may not feel like it to us? He is up to something, and it's always, 100% of the time, every second of every day, good. So in our laughter, in our tears, in the feel-great moments we wish would never end, in our day-to-day -day lives that seem mundane and predictable, and in the lonely questioning moments where we feel abandoned, confused, and deeply insecure, we can always, always, always respond to a God who is too good for words to describe and too loving for us to push away. We can always thank God for His goodness. So as this year comes to an end, may we be people who are obstinately thankful, whether life makes sense or not. Happy Thanksgiving. Again, we begin Advent next week, but before we get there, we're celebrating Thanksgiving Eve here in our space at 6.30. Hope you can join us then. And to remind you that we're doing Hanging of the Greens on Saturday from 4 to 6 here. With all these things, be reminded that you've been blessed to be a blessing. And so go forth and serve Christ in His name. Have a great week. Blessings. <laughs>